Today's topic is on basic EKG interpretation. I hope this presentation helps you in interpreting telemetry strips and EKGs because I know that this will help you in the future as you're caring for clients. Okay, so let's begin by talking about the electrophysiology. A thorough understanding of the electrophysiology of the cardiac muscle is essential to EKG interpretation. The human heart is intended to pump blood to the rest of the body, in particular the tissue and the organs. This process has two distinct components. First is conduction, the electrical impulse that tells the heart to beat. Okay. The second is the mechanical beating of the heart in response to the electrical stimulation resulting in the pumping of blood. To perform these two functions, the heart has two distinct types of cells. There are electrical conductive cells which in initiate electrical activity and conduct it through the heart. And there are mechanical or contracting cells which respond to the electrical stimulus and contract to pump the blood out. To evaluate a client's cardiac function, you must assess the mechanical fun function. Does the client have a strong palpating pulse? In other words, what that means is you can actually have electrical activity without having a pulse. That would be called electrical pulseless electrical activity, or PEA. So in other words, think about the heart as having two distinct functionings um, which initiates an electrical response response and then has a mechanical function of contracting. You can have one without the other, but obviously the client doesn't do so well if you're missing both. Okay, so next I want to talk about the cardiac conduction system. The beating heart produces a series of cardiac cycles which together become an EKG rhythm strip. Arrhythmias are categorized according to which pacemaker site initiates the rhythm. The normal heart electrical impulse originates in the sinus node and thus the normal heart rhythm is called normal sinus rhythm and it beats between 60 to 100 beats per minute. And so again you and I we are walking around usually with between 60 and 100 beats per minute based on that SA node firing off. If your palpating pulse and the rate is between 60 and 100, again, you suspect that that SA node, otherwise known as the pacemaker, is stimulating an electrical current throughout the rest of the, the conduction system, causing that contraction or that pumping. If the SA node does not fire, the AV junction or AV node, you can hear that term intertwined, starts to pick up the actual electrical firing. It is important to understand when the SA node fails, the AV node should take over. The AV node rhythms will be slower because obviously the rate of that particular pacemaking is 40 to 60 beats per minute. Since that SA node is not producing the pacing, the client will have no visible P wave because again that P wave indicates the SA node is firing. This lack of P wave informs me that the pacemaking is from the AV junction or AV node versus that SA node. This will be important because the heart blocks, when we talk about those, are known to have conduction problems between this SA node and the AV junction. So they probably will be slower. If the heart rate falls below 40, the conduction or the electrical stimulus is coming from the ventricles. The client with a ventricular rate, obviously 20 to 40 beats per minute, they're probably not doing very well and they probably lack some perfusion and will need immediate interventions. Again, if that pacemaker isn't working, we're going to have to take over it. Okay, so now let's talk about the PQRST complex. Here's a diagram of one electrical impulse. The P wave should precede every QRS complex. The P wave is the firing of the SA node and denotes atrial functioning and or contraction. The PR interval is important when discussing heart blocks. The QRS complex equates to the ventricular firing and subsequent contraction. The ST segment is important to talk about when we talk about myocardial infarction or heart attacks. The ST, if we had ST depression, this would indicate that the heart muscle is having ischemia or a lack of oxygen. 
obviously that's not a good thing. And where ST elevation, so if this ST segment was actually elevated, now we're talking about an MI where there's actually cardiac muscle tissue death. So there's actual damage from the lack of oxygen. Lastly is the T wave, which indicates the recovery phase of the cardiac cycle. It is important to understand the physiological aspects of the PQRST complex in order to have a greater understanding as we, as we start to talk about interpreting these strips. Okay, so let's talk about actual analyzing rhythm strips. Analyzing rhythm strips should be done systematically as outlined in this slide. You can see I have one, two, three, four, five, six ways of analyzing. First you start with the rhythm, the rate, the P wave, the PR interval, and the QRS complex. So first evaluate with whether the rhythm is regular or irregular based on the measurement between the R to R's. So again if you look at my mouse I have there's one R to one R and they should march out. So in other words, this distance between this R and this R should be the same distance between this R and this R and subsequently. So I could take a piece of paper and um, actually if I had this strip and act actually tick mark where each one of those R waves are and see if they measure out pretty consistent. If they do, then I would say that rhythm is regular. Alright, so the next step would be the rate. And the rate can be measured in two ways. A quick method of determining the heart rate is by counting the QRS complexes in a six second strip and then multiplying it by 10. So in other words, if this particular strip I have here on the slide was a six second strip, then I could just count the PQRST complexes, one, two, three, four, and I could times them by 10 to say that the patient or the client has 40 beats per minute right now. Or if I didn't know this actually was a six second strip, then I'm going to have to use some more math involvement. So now we're going to talk about the little squares here. So each little square is 0 0.04 seconds. And then each big square is 0.2 seconds. Five of those big squares or boxes are actually one second. That would be one second in time. 30 of those big squares is six seconds total. And then a um, total of 300 big squares would actually give us a whole minute. So if you had a long strip and we counted out all those big squares and they equaled 300, that whole strip would equate to one minute of actual electrical functioning so we could actually take the rate. But we're not going to do that because that wastes paper. So if I didn't have that six second strip, again I'm going to count the big the big squares from R to R and then I'm going to divide it by whatever number I get. So let's see, for example, if I take this R and go to this R. So let's see, that's one big square, two big squares, three big squares, and it looks like um, this goes in between the three and the four big big square. So what I would do is I would divide 300 by 3 and it gets gives me 100 beats per minute and then 300 by 4 and it gives me 75 so somewhere this rhythm is between 75 and 100 beats per minute. So again if this isn't a six uh, second strip because I should have gotten 40 because that's what we did with our little quick method. Alright so that is how to take the rate. Alright the next step then in this is we're going to look at the P wave. There should be one P wave for every QRS complex. If not, this could indicate arrhythmias secondary to the SA node not firing appropriately. In this strip, I do see a P wave, and I'm going to circle it with my mouse, for every QRS complex. I do see a P wave. So we do have a P wave. The fourth evaluation is the measurement of the PR interval. The normal uh, PR interval is, oops, mic over here. The normal PR interval is between 0.12 to 0 0.20. So again, that's between three, uh, three to five little little squares would actually give me the normal PR interval. So if we look at this this strip here, if I started counting the PR interval, I'm going to use my mouse. One, 
two, three, four. So four times four is 0.16. So we are between uh, 0.12 to 0 0.20, which then I could say, yes, this is a normal sort of PR interval. Should be, again, less than one of those big boxes or big squares. All right, so the next thing I'm going to do in my evaluation is the QRS complex. The QRS complex should be no more than 0.12 seconds or less than three little squares. Remembering this is important because a wide QRS complex could indicate a life-threatening arrhythmia. In this rhythm, the QRS is narrow, less than 0.12. And we can actually see here on the strip and count. It's, it's not, it's like one, one box maybe. All right. All right, so that's how we're going to start to analyze these rhythms. So let's start with this first one. Let's name this rhythm. Let's try it out. All right, first, is this rhythm regular or irregular? Okay. All right, so if you look, we're going to first think about the QRS complex. And remember, we're going to measure between the R and the R's all the way out to see if they, they march out. And they do. You can almost see it that it looks pretty regular if we were to actually measure between these two R's. So yes, I'm going to say this is a regular rhythm. Okay. Second, what is the rate? If this was a six second strip again, then we could use our quick method, which is to count these complexes. So one, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight times 10 is 80, and we'd get 80 beats per minute. Or if we were unsure if this was a six second strip, we'll go back to our method of counting these uh, large boxes. Okay, so I'm going to count the large boxes between the R and the R. So this one hits right on a big box. So one, two, three, almost five. So I'm going to say one, two, three, actually almost four. Four. So we're going to say somewhere in between three and four. So let's do four because it looks like it hits more on that fourth box. So four, 300 divided by four equals 75. So we're close to that 80 beats per myth, me, uh, minute with our quick method. Third, is there a P wave uh, for every QRS complex? Let's look at those P waves. Here's one, here's another, and so forth and so on. Yep, it looks like we do have a P wave um, before every QRS. So the SA note is doing pretty good. All right, next is the PR interval long. And if you remember, the PR interval is got to be between 0.12 and 0.20. So again, we're going to count those boxes. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to do it over here. So one, two, three, four. So four times four is 0.16. So it fits in between that 0.12 and 0.20. So yes, the PR interval is um, is not long, it's within normal. Lastly is, is the QRS complex narrow or wide? So again, looking at our QRS complex, looks pretty narrow just by looking at it. If I counted the boxes, looks like the boxes are about one and a half maybe. So it definitely fits in that um, 0.12 category. So this is a narrow. So let's say, what do you think this is? 80 beats per minute, it all falls within normal. You guessed it, normal sinus rhythm. Okay. Next, we're going to talk about atrial rhythms. Atrial arrhythmias have several features in common um, in that they originate above the ventricles and would therefore have a narrow QRS complex. The impulse has a little trouble getting through the atria in these atrial arrhythmias since it originated outside that SA node. So the SA node isn't firing. I like to think of it, all the atrial arrhythmias, arrhythmias as like teenagers that are firing off in the top of the heart and they're rebelling against the parent, which is the SA node. That's just how I like to think about it. The ectoc ectopic or irritable firing is overriding that pacemaker of the heart, again, that SA node. So using our systematic process, let's talk about this first rhythm of atrial fibrillation. Okay. The question is, again, is it regular or irregular? Well, again, if you look at the R waves, you can definitely see there's gaps in between these R, ray, um, R to R intervals, I should say. And so it would be irregular. All right, the next one is what is the rate? The rate is um, 
the ventricular rate anyway, because we can't really see the P waves, so we can't really measure those. The ventricular rate is 80 beats per minute if we're going by our quick method. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 8 times 10 is 80, so 80 beats per minute is what we could say in a quick sort of method. The next thing is, is there a P wave for every QRS complex? Well, I can't really see them. There's like squiggly lines, nothing's really nice and round, it's not uniform, so no, I would say there's not a P wave for every QRS complex. The atria are not polarizing in an effective way. Instead, they are, they are doing what we call fibrillating, that's why it's called atrial fibrillation. Is the PR interval long? Well, we can't really measure that because we can't really determine a P wave. So no, the PR, PRI interval cannot be measured. Is the QRS complex wide or narrow? Well, it's narrow because I can see that it's less than 0.12. So that's atrial fibrillation, all right? People can live with atrial fibrillation, in particular uh, if it's controlled with medication. If it's uncontrolled, meaning that you have a rapid rate greater than 100, there needs to be more interventions um, for that particular type of client. Next, we're going to talk about atrial flutter. Again, using our systematic process, process, is it regular or irregular? This one actually looks pretty regular. Okay, so. The really the difference between atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter right away you can see that this one looks regular where atrial fibrillation does not. So what is the rate? Atrial rate um, is really fast. You can see all of these what we call sawtooth looking P waves. Not really P waves, it's more of a ectopic beat somewhere in the heart muscle but not coming from the SA node. And then the vent ventricular rate, again if we counted up the R's, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, that's 7 times 10, 70 beats per minute, if this was a 6 second strip. Is there a P wave? Well, yeah, there is a P wave. Um, it's not a normal looking P wave. And there's, there is a 4 to 1 conduction here, so 4 uh, of the four of the atrial beats to one of the QRS. So you, they would say that's a four to one. One, two, three, four, and then you have a QRS complex. A four to one ratio P wave. Again, I would describe it as a sawtooth appearance. The PR interval, well, you can't really determine that uh, at all, so we can't even decide that. And the QRS is usually narrow in atrial flutter. Again, we could measure that, but it looks pretty narrow. And so this is some of the characteristics of atrial arrhythmias. The next topic is premature ectopic beats. Um, premature ectopic beats are ectopy or irritation of the heart muscle originating outside of the SA node. Again, there's some firing that's going on that's not originated in the actual SA node. But these are a little different than atrial fib and atrial flutter because it's just a little one-time or two-time incidence versus continuous. So premature ectopic beats have two types identified. Number one, as you can see, um, here is the first one is premature atrial contractions or PACs. You'll hear a lot of people call them PACs. And then the second one over here where they have this large wide looking uh, QRS complexes, that's called premature ventricular contractions known as PVCs. So you hear a lot of people say, oh, she's got some PVCs. And so I want you to look at these two rhythms and see the difference between them. One's one, one premature activity is coming from the top of the heart, the premature atrial contraction. One is coming from the bottom of the heart. All right, that's uh, a really key characteristic to kind of keep in mind. Wherever that ectopy is occurring, you're going to see it uh, morph into the rhythm itself. Okay? And I sort of lined out where the PAC is here in this one and where the PVCs are in this strip. Okay? Next we're going to talk about bradycardia. Bradycardia is defined as a rate of less than 60 beats per minute. Normally bradycardia is in of itself, it can be associated with poor perfusion to tissues or organs. Obviously if you're not in the normal range of 60 to 100 and you drop below that, you want to think that maybe there's not enough blood flow getting to the tissues. However, bradycardia can be normal finding in some clients, in particular the clients who exercise regularly. So just because you see a rate that's lower than 60, I don't want you just to assume that the client isn't doing okay. Always check your patient first, don't just look at the rhythm, check your patient.
With this rhythm, assessing the client would be warranted to determine how the client is responding to the slow rate. The rate appears um, let's start with our systematic process. The rate appears pretty regular. So again, if we march out these, this R to R interval, we're going to see that it maps out pretty evenly. So it's regular. What is the rate? Well, if we th thought this was a six second strip, we could just do one, two, three, four, and it'd be somewhere around four times 10, 40 beats per minute. But if we, again, we're going to look at those little squares and count between, um, I'm sorry, the big squares, and count the big squares between the R to R, we would find that they there was 8. So 300 divided by 8 is roughly 35 beats per minute. So more accurately, this patient probably is in 35 beats per minute. Is there a P wave for every QRS complex? Let's look. There looks like there is a P wave before that precedes every one of these QRS complexes. Is the PR interval long? Well, let's count them again. It needs to be between 0.12 and 0.20. Again, so let's count these boxes. So uh, 1, 2, 3, 4. So nope, it's within normal, so it's not long. And then is the QRS complex wide or narrow? It looks pretty narrow just by seeing it. And if we looked at those little boxes, uh, it should be less than 0.12. And it's only one and a half boxes. All right, so I would say that's narrow. So again, when you see a rhythm like this, check your patient first before assuming that the patient has poor perfusion or maybe, maybe has overdosed on beta blockers and now the rate is so slow. It could be an athlete. All right, so that's bradycardia. All right, so let's name this rhythm here. All right, so let's start with the first question we always ask, which is, uh, is it regular or irregular? Okay, so... First off, if you look again at the R to R interval, you can see that it looks pretty regular, right? If we were to actually measure those R to Rs, we would find that they're all pretty regular, right? So yes, they're regular. What is the rate? So again, if we do that quick method, uh, identifying the rate, we'll, we'll start to count those QRS complexes. One, two, three, four, five. So five times 10, so roughly around 50 beats per minute. And then is there a P wave for every QRS complex? Well, I don't really see a P wave. So we can't really tell if there's a P wave. I would say no. Um, is the PR interval long? Well, um, or, yeah, is the PR interval long? Well, you can't really tell because I can't see a P wave. And so that tells me if I don't have a P wave or I can't see a P wave that the, the probably firing isn't coming from the pacemaker of the heart. It's probably firing from um, a, the AV node or AV junction. Remember we said if firing is going on from the AV node, then you will have probably a rate between 40 and 60, which we do. And then is this complex wide or narrow? Yes, it is. If I counted it, this is a little blurry, but if, it, but if I counted it, it would be less than 0.12. So what is this? Well, if it's coming from the junction or the AV junction, we're probably going to name it, um, you guessed it, a junctional rhythm because that's exactly where this electrical stimulus is coming from. Okay, Junctional rhythm. All right, so next we're going to talk about heart blocks. These are fun. So I'm going to give you a little analogy as we're talking about heart blocks so you can kind of remember the difference between the four different types of heart blocks. So let's start with the first degree heart block. All right, so first degree heart block is where the PR interval is longer than 0 0.20 and it's constant across the strip. So again, if you are measuring every PR interval, every PR interval is going to be um, longer than that point. To zero. So my analogy is, is if you're waiting for a bus, the bus stop, and this is like the bus driver every day picks you up the same time, but he picks you up late every time. All right, so that's first degree heart block. Second degree heart block is the PRI uh, interval gets longer and longer until one P wave does not produce a QRS complex. So you'll actually have a dropped QRS complex. So again, in secondary type 1, otherwise known as Winky Bach, the PRI interval gets longer and longer and then you'll have a dropped QRS complex. So this analogy, again, back at the bus stop, the first day the bus driver's on time, yay! The second day the bus driver's five minutes late, 
Oh no, and the third day the bus driver is 10 minutes late. You're really mad about this. And then the last day of the week the bus driver just doesn't show up at all. So that's that dropped QRS complex. Again, second degree type 2. All right, or type 1, sorry. So second degree type 2. So let's talk about the type 2 of second degree blocks. There can be two or three or four or may uh, or more P waves for every QRS complex because the AV node blocks out many of those impulses. So my analogy for these two, three, four or more P waves for every QRS complex is you're waiting at the bus stop and the bus driver's on time the first day, he's on time the second day, he's on time the third day, but the last day he doesn't show up at all. Again, you lose that QRS complex. Third degree heart block, this is where you have a total obstruction at the AV node resulting in atrial and ventricular disassociation. So the top of the heart and the bottom of the heart is not communicating. So the analogy for this, back to the bus system, you're waiting at the bus stop and the bus driver just keeps passing you by every single day. That would be complete heart block. So let's look at these actually in their rhythms, okay? All right, so heart, heart blocks can be a challenge. I will try and make this as simple as possible. First, heart blocks are caused by conduction disturbances at that AV node. So let's start by asking, is it regular, okay? So is it regular? Yes, it appears regular. I see that if I was to measure out this R to R interval that they would be the same. So that is true. It is a regular rhythm. The rate, um, it, if this was a six second strip, is 50. So one, two, three, four, five. Five times 10 is 50. So it would be about 50 beats per minute. So it's slow. We know that. Is the PR interval long? So if we counted up the PR interval, um, and that's from here to here, looks really long just by looking at it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, like ten little boxes. That's way over 0 0.20. So yes, the PR interval is long. The distance between the P wave and this R wave is extremely long. And it's consistent. You can see the P wave here to here, here to here, here to here. All measures out the same. So yes, again, back to that bus analogy, okay, where you have, you're waiting at the bus and the bus driver always shows up late. Again, the P is always long, this PR interval is always long. Okay, so that's first degree heart block. People live in her, her, uh, first degree heart block. So this heart block isn't as serious as some of the others we're going to talk about. All right, next let's talk about uh, second degree heart blocks. We have type 1 and type 2. Second degree heart block, um, th the first thing again we're going to use our systematic process in this type 1. Is it regular? Okay. Uh, no, you can tell that right away it's not regular. You can see there's a huge gap between this R to R. So I would say no, it is not regular. And the next thing I'm going to ask is what is the rate? Well, it looks like if we did that, it would be hard to do the rate, but if we just did it in our quick method, one, two, three, four, five, it's definitely slower, so somewhere around 50 beats per minute. Is there a P wave for every QRS complex? Well, there's a P wave, there's a P wave, there's a P wave, there's a P wave, and there's no QRS here. All right, you see that dropped, um, that dropped QRS complex? Is the, P, um, is the PR interval long? So let's look, let's start with this first one. This first one here looks um, probably normal actually this first one's normal the second one here looks longer than the first one the third one looks even longer than the second one and then when we go to this last fourth one again there's a dropped QRS complex so again if I go back to my analogy I'm waiting at the bus stop the bus driver's on time the first day here's that PR interval the next day it's a little longer that's a, again I have a five minute wait and then the third day I'm waiting for the bus and I have a 10 minute delay because it's longer and then the last day the bus driver just doesn't show up so again that's second degree heart block type one 
So let's take a look at second degree heart block type 2 looking here to the right side. So is it regular? No. We can tell that right away. There's a huge gap between some of these R to R intervals. What is the rate? Again, if this is a six second strip, one, two, three, four, five, six, I would say it's more like five. So five times 10 is 50. So 50 beats per minute if we were doing our quick method. And next is, is there a P wave for every QRS complex? Well, there's a P wave, this first one, and I do see a QRS complex. Uh, the next P wave doesn't have a QRS complex. The next P wave does have a QRX complex. The next one has a QRS complex. The next one, and they all look even. The ones that I see here, the, the PR, uh, the P wave an interval looks pretty consistent. But then when we get to this fourth one, there's a dropped QRS complex. So the analogy is I'm waiting at the bus. The bus driver's on time the first day. You can see here, if we look right in the middle, the first day, this PR interval is normal. The second day shows up on time also because, again, it's the same interval as the first day. The third day, again, same PRI interval, so he shows up on time. And then that last day when I get to the bus stop, he doesn't even show up at all. Okay, so that's second degree type two. And again, the last thing is, is, is the QRS complex wide or narrow? It looks pretty narrow to me. All right, so the next one I'm going to talk about is the actual worst heart block, which is um, complete heart block. So third degree heart block is the worst. Three strikes and you're out, so to speak. So again, this is the worst one. The rhythm is irregular. The rate is slow. Um, you can tell that just by looking at it. The P wave is regular uh, all by itself. If we look at them, they look regular but they don't look like they match up with the QRSs at all. You can actually march out the P waves um, as seen in the red arrow and sometimes they're buried in the QRS but the P waves are regular. You aren't able to measure the PRI interval because the P waves aren't corresponding to um, the QRSs. It's like the P wave refuses to talk to the QRS complex. The QRS complexes, um, as depicted in the blue, are regular with each other and appear less than 0.12, so they're narrow. If the QRS is greater than 0.12, the focus is probably ventricular. Again, the, the electrical stimulus is probably more ventricular if it's wider. Then we have a third degree heart block. The P waves in the QRS complexes are not communicating. Clients with third degree heart block need a pacemaker placed. If the client is unstable, meaning the blood pressure is low, the patient has a change in level of consciousness, really you need to think about external pacemaking right away in order to help perfuse that patient. And then wait for the OR to come pick the patient up so they can get an internal pacemaker placed. Again, this is more of a serious um, arrhythmia. Now this analogy, again back to our bus, I'm waiting at the bus stop and every day the bus driver just keeps passing me by. So again, they're not communicating. All right, so let's see if we can name this rhythm. Uh, is it regular? No, not really. It doesn't look regular. The rate is slow. I would want to palpate the pulse if I saw this rhythm. There's not a P wave for every QRS and it's difficult to measure a PR interval. Uh, since uh, the P wave doesn't appear to be consistent in lining up with the QRS complex at all, right? You don't see the P waves lining up. The QRS is wide but regular with each other. Did you guess it? Do you guess what this is? Again, you're on the you're at the bus stop and the bus keeps passing you by. You got to think of a uh, pacemaker with this patient. All right, this is third degree heart block. All right, so next we're going to now move away from the bradycardic and heart block rhythms. We're going to talk about tachycardia. Tachycardia is defined as a rate greater than 100 beats per minute. Let's systematically go through the identification. All right, the first thing, is it regular? Uh, yes, it is regular. The rate is, if we counted this rate, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So 12 times 10 is 120. That's what I get. So this patient is somewhere between 120 to 130 beats per minute if this was a six second strip. If there was a P wave for every QRS, is there a P wave for every QRS? Yep, I do see a P wave for every QRS complex. 
Uh, is the PR interval between 0.12 and 0 0.20? Again, that's about three to five little boxes between this interval. And yes, it is, so it's within normal. Is the QRS complex wide or narrow? Well, just by looking at it without even taking out any measurement of my little boxes or squares, it does appear to be narrow. This is sinus tachycardia. All right, you and I could probably run around the block and create this rhythm right now. All right. Next one is what we call supraventricular tachycardia. This uh, rate is uh, a tachycardic rate, but the rate for supraventricular tachycardia is greater than 150 beats per minute. So that's the difference between sinus tachycardia and supraventricular tachycardia. Is the rate is is definitely faster for this, and because it's supraventricular. That means that the firing is definitely coming above um, the actual in the atrium itself. The rate is greater than 150 beats per minute. The P wave could be buried within the QRS complex, but we really do not know what the underlying rhythm is because it's so fast. So the QRS complex is narrow. So this type of patient, we need to slow this rhythm down so we can see what the underlying rhythm is because we can't even see. We don't know if they're in AFib. We don't know if they're actually just in a sinus rhythm that's gone fast. Um, so some of the possible treatments for a patient in SVT is vagal maneuvers. So we can vagal maneuvers means we can have them bear down and grunt. We can have them cough. Um, we can have them blow into a straw. All of those produce vagal maneuvers um, to have the patient slow down that heart rate. We can use medication like adenosine. Adenosine will actually um, stop the heart for a brief second. It's a medication and it lasts a very short period of time. And then we can lastly, if that doesn't work and the patient's unstable, we could cardiovert, which is providing a little bit of an electrical shock to the patient to try to get them out of this rhythm. So that's supraventricular tachycardia, otherwise known as SVT. All right. All right, so next we're going to move in away from um, the tachycardia rhythms to the ventricular rhythms. Ventricular arrhythmias are the most serious arrhythmias because the heart is left less effective than usual and because the heart is less effective than usual the heart really isn't functioning well. It's really on the last level of electrical support if it's ventricular rhythm. Ventricular tachycardia, otherwise known as VTAC, is a rhythm originating from a single irritable focus within the ventricles. It looks very much like an uninterrupted series of PVCs, if you remember back at the, PV, the one PVC that I showed you. So if we went by our analysis, is it regular or irregular? It is regular. It's a ventricular rhythm because it's wide. It's definitely regular. The rate uh, is definitely more than probably about 150. If we counted these up, I think I counted 15. 15 times 10 is 150. But we don't know what the atrial rate is. We don't actually the atrium is probably not even firing. Is there a P wave for every QRS? Nope, no P wave at all. Is the PR interval long? Since the rhythm originates in the ventricles, there wouldn't be a PRI interval, right? Is the QRS complex wide or narrow? Oh my gosh, it's very wide. I think of wide and I think of wide and die. So this is life-threatening. You have to memorize this rhythm. Um, what I think of, if I have had patients awake and having this rhythm, and so if they're awake and alert, I'm going to think about some particular medications that could stimulate this out of this particular rhythm. Uh, if they're not awake, then I want to defibrillate, right? Or and start some CPR right not awake defibrillate if they're awake drugs I will take that's a little ditty for ventricular tachycardia otherwise known as VTAC all right the next lethal rhythm is um, what we call ventricular fibrillation or VTAC um, it's an indication of extreme myocardial irrit irritability the heart muscle is dying many ventricular foci initiate impulses in a chaotic fashion you can see this looks very chaotic causing the ventricles to fibrillate in an inefficient manner so again back to our systematic system is it regular or irregular it looks irregular very chaotic and irregular what's the rate well you can't really even determine the rate is the P wave for every QRS complex? No, you can't even discern a P wave. Is the PR interval long? Well, there is no PRI interval here. 
Is the QRS complex wide or narrow? Well, you can't even tell if that's a QRS complex. If you see this, well, A, you need to memorize it. And if you see this, this is life-threatening. You need to begin CPR and defibrillate. All right. All right, so the last one I ended on was asystole. When all electrical activity within the heart ceases, it is seen as, on this EKG as a straight line. A lot of movies you'll say they, the, the patient has flatlined. Um, the arrhythmia again is called asystole and CPR is warranted for this one. I would suggest though I've had patients where I saw this on the monitor thinking I needed to bring the crash card in and begin CPR and they actually just pulled off one of their leads. So always check your patient first if you're watching a monitor. All right. This concludes our discussion on basic EKG interpretation.